Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight we're in Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to divide Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 into two sections. It's a kind of a natural division in Daniel 7. Because in Daniel 7 you have the vision that Daniel has. And then in verses 15 and following, you get the interpretation of the vision. So, so this week, we're going to focus on the vision itself, particularly uh, one of the more well-known texts or even controversial texts that's in Daniel, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, as to what that's talking about. Uh, so it'll give us time to focus there. And then next week, we'll focus on the interpretation of the vision itself. So if you remember, Daniel 7, we're going to read Daniel 7 in just a second. But um, we're coming to the end of the Aramaic section in Daniel. From Daniel 2, like verse 4, to the end of chapter 7, it's been in Aramaic. And there are only some sections in Ezra that are also Aramaic. The rest of the, the, rest of the Israel's Bible is uh, Hebrew, but Daniel has Aramaic and Ezra has Aramaic. Um, Daniel has most of the Aramaic. So we're coming to the end of that in chapter 7. Um, a lot of theories as to why it's some, why some of it's Hebrew and some of it's Aramaic. And we talked about that earlier in the class. But what I want to remind us of is how chapters 2 and 7 parallel each other. You can think about chapter 1 as kind of an intro. Introduces Daniel and his situation in Babylon. But in chapters 2 and 7, what is in common are these four kingdoms. Remember in chapter 2, it was the statue. Uh, and the statue had gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Representing four kingdoms. And we'll have four beasts in chapter 7. But then in chapters 3 and 6, they parallel each other. Remember what chapter 3 was about? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, fiery furnace. Daniel 6 was the lion's den. So we have kind of the deliverance of God's people, at least these particular persons. God is delivering them from... Uh, danger from death, uh, sort of like how God delivers Israel from death and in, in the return from the exile. Um, but then in chapters 4 and 5, what do we have? Chapter 4 is about Nebuchadnezzar, who lost his mind, basically, had some sort of mental breakdown, mental illness. And that became like a, a beast of the field. Uh, and his response to that was submission, right? He submitted to God and acknowledged God. Belshazzar, in chapter 5, right, gets the handwriting on the wall and is not submissive, more dismissive, more, we talked about how he was playing um, the game a little bit there. And... Uh, wanted to try to change God's mind by honoring Daniel. But we talked about that earlier. So this is, and this is the Aramaic section. Yeah. So that's all the Aramaic. And they're basically court stories, right? It's prose narrative. It's a narrative telling of these stories. Uh, but now we're going to move into a new section. Beginning with chapter 7, we move into a different genre, apocalyptic. And 7 through 12 is going to be apocalyptic genre. Now, apocalyptic is, the word just means revelation. Like the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament, as we have it, is the apocalypse. That's the Greek word for it, the apocalypse, the revelation. So an apocalypse is something that unveils what is hidden, 
it pulls back the curtain, you might say, and we're able to see what's going on. Now, we're, when we're looking horizontally here and we're looking around us, what we see are Russia and China and the United States, and we see nations and we see struggles between nations and etc. But what the apocalyptic intends to do is to pull back the veil and see what's going on behind that. Uh, who's, who's driving this chariot? You know, uh, What's the agenda of who are the spiritual beings that lie behind? What's the cosmic warfare that's going on? And apocalyptic assumes a kind of a cosmic battle between good and evil, and that God is engaged in that battle through his messengers, his angels, his representatives, and that ultimately God is going to defeat the powers, but the people of God are going to suffer before that ultimate defeat happens. So you're going to have suffering before glory, which is the story of the Messiah, right? Suffer and then enter into glory. Pete, did you have your hand up? Yeah, it, it's not only the end time. Apocalyptic is, is not necessarily about the end. It can be, and it often is, but it can also be about the unfolding of history. You know, like these four kingdoms, for example, would be kind of a unfolding of history. And to what extent apocalyptic is eschatological, that is about the end, the eschaton, the last times, that's a big debate. And uh, you're going to find people on all sides of that. Uh, some would say, you know, the apocalyptic here is about the end time. To what extent is Daniel's apocalyptic about eschatology or about the eschaton or the last days or the last time or the end of time, right? All those different phrases we might use to describe it. And that's debated. In other words, when we talk about these four kingdoms, when, where, what, uh, who, uh, these are, you know, there's a lot of debate about these. And uh, some would suggest, as we'll talk about a little bit, uh, next week, particularly when we talk about interpreting the beast, we'll talk more in detail about the different views of that. Um, tonight, we just kind of want to get our feet wet and, and, and get into the vision and, and see what the vision says and pay attention to its details. And then next week, um, we will focus on the interpretation of the vision itself. But, but yeah, apocalyptic and, the apocalyptic and eschatology strongly overlap in so many ways, but there's a real discussion about um, how they mesh together and when they mesh together. There are apocalyptic visions that are not about the end times. Um, like, the apocalyptic vision of Babylon is not about the end time, right? but it, it, some people would, would want to, to think of it that way. But good point. So this first vision, the Daniel, this is the first vision Daniel has, basically. Uh, previously, he's been interpreting dreams or handwriting, right? He didn't have the vision himself. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and then he had a second dream, and then Belshazzar had this handwriting on the wall, and Daniel comes in and interprets it. But now Daniel has his own dream, his own vision, uh, and that's what we want to read here. So let's begin, Daniel 7, beginning in verse 1, take our time to read this text. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. And Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea, four great beasts, each different from the others came up out of the sea. 
The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. It on its back had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was, this beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little horn, which came up from among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke arrogantly. As I looked, thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch. Because of the boastful words the horn was speaking, I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Right, that kind of naturally falls into two sections, doesn't it? You got one vision that is focused on what's coming out of the sea. How's that sea described? Is this a calm sea? Yeah, it's churning, it's turbulent, it's chaotic. It's kind of you get the picture of Genesis 1, you know, that that the earth was without form and empty, and there was it was darkness, and the waters were present and and the waters in Israel's language, in Israel's sort of worldview, the sea is a scary place. It's filled with unknowns. And it's dangerous, right? And so what comes out of the sea is not something you expect to be very nice. And that's exactly what we have here. So you have kind of a, the chaos. That, and you think about it, it's not hard for us to imagine, is it? that the world is in such a chaotic space, that the world is so filled with chaos that horrible things arise out of it. I mean, that's the history of the world, isn't it? That sort of thing. So that, that's kind of the picture we have. And what was what's Daniel's response to that? Ultimately, he's terrified by it. I don't think we were told that here in, in what we read, but... We will get to it uh, later on, that he's terrified by what he sees. So these beasts are coming out of the chaos, we might say. 
And there's four. And I've on the handout, I've um, just kind of put a little chart together to identify some of the particulars of the winged lion. But one of the interesting things here is the winged lion becomes what? Like who? Comes like a human being. So it's a winged lion. The wings are taken off. And the lion kind of gets on its hind legs, as it were, and becomes like a human being and is given a human mind. Now, you remember the statue. Who's the head of gold in the statue? Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar was. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He became a beast, right? It's the other way around, right? So here, the lion becomes a human being, and Nebuchadnezzar, a human being, became a beast, right? So it gets, it's a reversal. And I think there's something really important about noticing how the beast becomes a human being, because it happens with the last beast too, right? The unidentified animal, we're not told what that, we're not, we're not given a, an analogy with that animal. It's, it's just a terrifying animal, just unimaginable terror uh, kind of animal. We're not even going to call him a bear or a lion or a, or a leopard. Uh, we're just not going to name him because this is such a horrendous and horrifying creature. But he's, he becomes a human being. Right. He, the little horn in particular is given human eyes and an arrogant mouth. So think back to Genesis 1. These waters, the creation of the animals, and human beings are created. How are we described? How are we identified in creation? The image of God. We're the image of God. And we and, and human beings are given what? dominion right we're given dominion over the earth over the over the beast of the field the birds in the air and the fish of the sea we're given dominion so the way this is supposed to work is that human beings are god's representatives in the world and they care for the creation they care for the wild beast and the fish and the, you know the earth and so on but what this vision is is a reversal of that. Instead of human beings having dominion over the earth, these beasts are given dominion. And they're and they're terrifying beasts. These are not, these are not beasts who are up to good, right? They're up to no good. They're, they're out to destroy and to trample and to break into pieces, to devour. But they're given dominion. And we might, we might think of it this way. They're given dominion because human beings gave it up dominion. They, le they relinquished dominion by their own um, self-interestedness. Right? That they want to make a name for themselves instead of receiving the, uh, the authority and the gift and the dominion. To represent God, they created their own fiefdoms and they created their own dominion. Uh, and they wanted to make a name for themselves, like at the Tower of Babel. So God, so the vision uses this imagery of, re of reversal. So these are human governments that are rising out of this chaos. And they rise out of the chaos not to serve humanity or to care for the creation, they come to devour it and destroy it and in their own self-interestedness. Ultimately epitomized by the little horn who speaks boastfully or arrogantly, blaspheming, as we'll see later on uh, in the interpretation, and persecuting the people of God, as we'll see in the interpretation. But I think that's one of the major points to get from this, that uh, there's that reversal happening here. Whereas humanity is supposed to have a, uh, a benevolent dominion over the beast. The beasts that arise out of the sea now have a, uh, uh, a terrifying dominion over humanity. 
uh, and devour humanity and destroy the earth as well, you know, because they're not going to take care of the earth. Um, any comments, questions about that? I mean, that's that's kind of the first point here. Or anything about um, the particulars of the beast themselves? Um, a leopard is very fast. That might come into play in the interpretation of the leopard. Has four heads. That might be important in the interpretation as well, because the four heads probably represent four divisions of the kingdom or four kings or four something. Yeah, yeah, and talk about you talking about in verse one, the, the the four winds. I think that's just east, north, south, and west. You know, just the four corners of the earth kind of thing. So I don't I don't know that it's um, a reference to any angelic beings. I think it's more just a picture of creation, right? Because the spirit of God was hovering over the waters, right, and. Uh, the Ruach of God. So this is the Ruach. These are the four winds. They could represent some angelic forces, maybe. I wouldn't exclude that. But I think the imagery is more um, focused on, um, on the creation story itself. But I might be wrong about that. Certainly the four great beasts, there's something standing behind them. Uh, there's, there's, there's a a cosmic evil power that stands behind the four great beasts. So you might think that way about the four winds too. Yeah. If there were four base beasts countries like Middle Persia and Greece. And yeah. Well, you're raising the interpretation question. Who are these beasts? What who do they represent? And definitely um, we're going to get into that next week. Who who the, who they might represent? And there are several different views about that. Is not. Not everybody agrees on this. Uh, so we'll have to talk about that next week. Any other particulars you want to raise a question about? I mean, the ten horns, we're told later they represent ten kings. You know, um, But it has iron teeth, which kind of connects us with uh, the statue that has iron legs. Well, the beast has iron teeth. You know, the fourth beast has iron teeth. So there's some connections between two and seven, and we'll we'll point out some of those next week in more detail. I want to say, yeah. the study of them, like Daniel and everything like that, all these writings, really make the book of Revelation come to life. Yeah, now Revelation uses a lot of the imagery that comes from Daniel. So the question in, in terms of Revelation is, is Revelation and Daniel talking about the same thing? Or are Daniel and Revelation just apocalyptic literature using the same symbols and not necessarily talking about the same thing? So that, that gets really uh, tricky, you know, and uh, a lot of debate about that because uh, some will take what we read in Daniel and, oh, ten horns, wow. That beast in Revelation has ten horns too. You know, chapter 13 of Revelation. They must be the same beast. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. You know, I think we have to think about that more carefully than just, because these are symbols that are um, common. You know, it's not like this is the only ten-horned beast that's ever been talked about in the history of apocalyptic literature. Uh, yeah. See that these may pretend to Daniel's time or Revelation might pretend to more the end time. Yeah, it's possible. possible. Yeah, it's possible. And we're gonna we'll get into some of that. But um, for example, one might argue that the little horn here that arises out of the ten horns is the the beast of Revelation in thirteen and seventeen that has ten horns. And, um, and a little horn comes up uh, and someone say, well, that's the same thing. Talking about the same person. And for some, that's the Antichrist at the end of time, right? And for others, that's like somebody like Nero, you know, uh, who persecuted Christians. And there's all kinds of theories in between. 
<laughs> you know, so that's when it gets that's when it gets really um, problematic. You know, in the 1940s, the little horn was Hitler. You know, um, you know, and um, in the in the 1550s, uh, the little horn was Queen Elizabeth. I mean, 1560s, excuse me. Um, so, it, 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 you know, part of it is we're looking at the text through our contemporary eyes and we're trying to think, okay, who's our little horn, you know? Or, and maybe it, that is the little horn, you know? But maybe the little horn is just a symbol of something that happens over and over and over again, which is another theory, you know? That's why Daniel gets hard. You know, it, 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 it's not always so clear uh, how to manage our understanding of the text. Yeah, Jeff. You mentioned there are other pinhorn beasts in apocalyptic literature. Are there other examples in ancient Near East of the combination of different literary genres coming together like they do in Daniel and even... Uh, the mixing of Aramaic and Hebrew and narrative and short sheets and yeah. apocalyptic, or is Daniel unique in that? Yeah. Like, well, the, way the final form of Daniel comes together. Are there equivalents? Yeah, I think I think you can. Uh, well, for example, in Revelation, you have a pistol or you know you have epistles. That's a genre uh, that's then uh, then that's attached to an apocalyptic narrative, right? But I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that. I'm not really sure. I'm thinking about Enoch, um, Apocalypse of Peter. Um, I just don't have a good memory of that. Sure. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that one. Yeah. All right, let's turn to the, yeah, Pete. As long as it's not about First John, you can ask a question. <laughs> no, go ahead. Well, uh, when you say Holy Roman Empire, you're talking about the medieval Roman Imp Holy Roman Empire, the the, the German. Um, uh, some would say that that's one understanding of the Ten Kings. Is kind of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, some would say the Holy Roman Empire is an extension of the Roman Empire. And that the Roman Empire still exists today in some sense through the vestiges of the Holy Roman Empire. And that in the end time, the little horn is going to reassemble the empire, the Roman Empire, and uh, persecute the people of God in some, as a kind of a global empire, right? Which is one of the reasons why there are some who are so fearful of globalists. You've heard that language, globalist. Oh, we can't be globalist. You know, we're Americans. We're not globalist. And they're one of the reasons uh, there's an opposition to globalism is because the little horn is going to lead a global government in their understanding. So if you get a global government, the little horn's going to show up. Right? So we don't want to be globalist. But if the little horn is who they think the little horn is, there's going to be a global empire. I mean, the, <laughs> they're not going to be able to stop that. Uh, but that's part of the, see, part of this is when you get into Daniel and Revelation and start thinking through some of these things, uh, there's a lot of um, fear mongering that goes on. There's a lot of um, identification with this or that. Like for one, at one time, the 10 horns were thought to be the 10 countries that made up the European Commonwealth. Now there's more of them, and so ten doesn't fit anymore. Uh, so you got to look for something else that's ten. You know, so you know we try to we're trying to understand it. We're trying to try to see what God wants us to see here, and uh, sometimes we make associations with our contemporary world that turn out to be inaccurate, like. Hitler's the little horn. Well, no, he's not. You know. He may be a form of little horn. You know, if little horn is, is more like a, 
a symbol of something that happens over and over again, then yeah, Hitler is a little horn, right? Um, like Napoleon was a little horn kind of thing. And so, you know, we can, we can think about it that way, but that's not typically how you're going to find it on the internet. You're going to find it on the internet and some of the preaching that you would hear in some churches that we're still waiting for the little horn himself um, to show up. But we'll get more into the interpretation later. So let me move on to the second half. Because I think this is, this is, yeah, this is the help. This is a hopeful part, right? Uh, in verses 9 to 14, where we have the Ancient of Days and the description of the Ancient of Days, or some translations will say the Ancient One. Um, where are we? Where is Daniel when you know when uh, we have the beast vision? Where where's Daniel? He's kind of looking at the earth, right? He's kind of looking at the sea and what's coming out of the sea and onto the land to devour the living beings on the land. And so, a, an important question to think about in verse nine: Where is Daniel? As as I looked, I, I'm looking. I'm continuing to look. Maybe I was looking at earth, and now I'm looking at heaven kind of heavens and the earth. So I would tend to think, though not everybody would agree, but I would tend to think that the thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That that's kind of a heavenly picture. That's kind of the throne room of God picture. And this throne, and this is where we kind of get the old man picture of God, right? You know, the, the white hair, White as snow, white like wool. I hope that doesn't mean it feels like wool, you know, but it looks like, it looks like wool, all right? So it's white. Right? Every time I get a haircut and I see that hair on the ground, I think, ooh, that's getting whiter and whiter, you know? Pretty soon it's only going to be white. Right? Um, and his throne in verse 9 was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. How does a throne have wheels? Is this a wheelchair? The old man has a wheelchair? <laughs> no, it's not a wheelchair. What is it? It's a chariot. Yeah, a chariot. In fact, we have a lot of ancient literature, like Baal mythology, Baal mythology, that where it rides across the sky in a chariot. Right? Uh, and Ezekiel chapter 1 has this language of... of um, God's chariot, you know, that, that God is kind of riding across the sky in a chariot. You know? So that's, that's kind of the imagery we have here. So I, I see this as kind of heaven. The sea and the beast are on the earth. But Daniel's now seeing heaven, which gets us back to that creation language of heaven and earth, even though the word heaven's not used here. But that throne is a moving chariot you know, that's going across the sky. And a river of fire was flowing from it. Kind of a, a dynamic picture of God. That God is active, engaged. And thousands upon thousands are surrounding it. Where do you get thousand times, ten thousand times, ten thousand? Where do you get that language again? Yeah, Revelation. Revelation chapter 5. That John saw these Angels, thousands and upon thousands, ten times, ten thousand times ten thousand. So we are getting a kind of a throne room scene here. And the court was seated. Remember all the court stories, you know, that we've been talking about in Daniel. Now this court, God's court, the throne of God, that court is seated. You notice it has thrones plural as well as throne singular. The Ancient of Days sits on a throne. Yeah. Yeah, it might be kind of like a council, a divine council. Some would suggest there's a divine council here, that there are others seated on thrones too, but God is seated on his throne, the Ancient of Days on his throne. Um some would suggest that you know these other thrones are about um, beings who are given authority 
like the prince of Egypt is given authority, um, the, the angel over Egypt or the angel over Greece or something like that, that maybe they're sitting on thrones here. I mean, that's possible. That can make sense. But then here's what happens. In verse 13, oh, by the way, you know, it's verses 11 and 12 interrupt this picture of heaven. It's kind of like he's, he's watching this picture in heaven and then he hears the little horn over here. His, his attention is drawn to the little horn. And what's the little horn doing? Yeah, speaking. Um, these boastful words and and the little horn is destroyed. <clears throat> but verse 12 says, the other beast, now this is really kind of an interesting statement that we need to take account of when we interpret this. Are all the other beasts destroyed? Just the little horns destroyed. The other beasts have been stripped of their authority. And they don't have any more power, but they still exist. So if you think of like the statue here of Babylon, the head of gold, Medo-Persia, the, the chest of silver, um, then Greece uh, being the thighs of bronze, and then the legs being Rome. If that's the way you read that, that's the way you understand it. Maybe we need to, to back off that a little bit and say, you know, there's something about these kingdoms, they're still around. They're not gone. The little horn is gone now, but these other kingdoms are still there. And so what are we going to do with that? Um, well, we'll talk about that more when we get to the interpretation. See, I'm pushing it all off, and then the plane will be late, and I can go, oh, sure. Yeah, I think I can get out of this. Then we're just going to skip it. Because <laughs> uh, this is where I can hear all kinds of conflict. Uh, not in our not in our case here, because um, we don't fight about things like that. But um, but there are people who do fight about things like that about how you interpret this. Uh, so let's get down to verses thirteen and fourteen because I think we got just a few minutes left here. I think this is one of the most uh, significant texts in terms of correlation of this vision with the New Testament. One like the Son of Man. And we're all probably familiar with the idea that Jesus takes this language of Son of Man and adapts that as his title. He uses Son of Man as his own title. Right? And most people think he gets that from Daniel chapter 7, that that's where, that's where that language is coming from. So in the vision at night, I looked. So I'm, you know, I was looking at the Ancient of Days, and then I got distracted by the little horn. And now I've come back to look at the Ancient of Days again. And instead, I don't see the Ancient of Days alone or by himself. What I see is one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. It's a human being. And this human being is going to be led into the presence of Ancient of Days, and this human being is going to be given authority. Which is what human beings were given in the creation. We were given authority, dominion. The beast took it over, or we gave it to the beast. <laughs> Uh, we relinquished our authority to the beast. But now the Son of Man, this human being, has entered the throne room of God and been given authority over the earth, over the beast, over the creation, in a kingdom that will never end. Right? And that includes authority over all nations and peoples and languages. Now, Jesus takes this language of Son of Man and says, that's me. And you remember at the end of Matthew, Jesus says, all 
authority has been given to me. Something has happened. All authority has been given to me. Let, let's go to a text in Matthew. We don't usually do this, but I think this is this language is pretty direct. Uh, let's go to Matthew 26 and verse 64. Well, we'll begin at verse 63. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, and watch this language, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. It's really important to watch what he did there. Because on the one hand, he uh, this Son of Man language, the Son of Man says, right hand of God. Where's that language coming from? That's not in Daniel, that he sits at the right hand. It's in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. All right. Which is an enthronement psalm. It's a, it's a psalm about becoming king and taking the rightful place at the right hand of God. Right. The other language is coming from Daniel 7, coming on the clouds. And that's coming from Daniel 7. Now, when you're reading Daniel 7, here's the debate. And then when you're reading this, uh, Matthew text, and there's a similar Mark text and a similar Luke text, uh, that parallel text. What kind of coming is he talking about? Uh, is he coming to the Ancient of Days? Or is he coming from the Ancient of Days? In Daniel 7, it seems to me, my opinion is, that he's coming to the Ancient of Days. He's riding on the clouds. That is, he's, an, he's a divine figure. He's a human being being raised up in the clouds, riding the chariot, as it were, right? In the clouds, coming to the Ancient of Days who, as the representative human being, receives the kingdom, receives authority and power from the Ancient of Days, and then is able to sit down at the right hand. That is to be kind of the second in power, right? To use kind of a royal imagery. So I think that here in Matthew, Jesus is saying to Caiaphas, the high priest, that yes, I am the Son of Man. I am the Messiah, the Son of God. I am the Son of Man who is, who is going to ascend to the Ancient of Days and receive authority. And from now on, you're going to, when you look for me, from now on, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, riding on his chariot, you might say, or coming with the clouds. That is, existing in the authority. So I would suggest that what we have here is, um, is kind of an, a, an ascension or an enthronement that Jesus is going to sit down and he, go, he goes with the clouds. Right? Remember Acts 1, the picture in Acts chapter 1, he ascends with the clouds which is more about enthronement. He's being enthroned uh, at the right hand of God. And he's going to sit, but there will be a day when he comes again to the earth right, to reign. So there's 
two ways of thinking about the coming. In Daniel 7, he's going to the Ancient of Days. And Matthew 26 refers to that. But if you go to Mark 13, 24, and again, there's debate about this, but if you go to Mark 14, uh, let's say, let's be in 26. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. And many people think that's talking about the second coming there in chapter 13, verses 26 and 27. So whatever we're saying, this is about clouds. And clouds is not about um, the physicality necessarily. It's more about the symbolism of power and glory, of exaltedness. He's going to ascend with the clouds, reign with the clouds, and descend with the clouds. So in, I think in Mark, or, yeah, well, it's in Mark 2 as well, Mark 14, like Matthew 26, it's about ascension. But here in Mark 13, it's about descending. Yeah. The, Paul talks about this too in 1 Thessalonians. He said exactly that. We are still alive. Our left will be caught up together with the down in the crowd to meet the Lord in the Lord Yeah, in the and the Lord is going to descend with the trumpet and the shout. The Lord will descend. So there is going to be a descent, right? Going to descend to the earth. So when we're talking about the coming of Jesus, got to be, got to think more precisely. What are we talking about? What do you? There's a coming to the Ancient of Days where he receives all authority and sits down at the right hand of God. And then there will be a day when he comes um, to reign in fullness when the kingdom of God fully appears uh, at the second coming of Christ. Now the debate then is, okay, what does the second coming of Christ have to do with Daniel chapter 7? That's when we get into interpretation. <laughs> and that's next week, as long as the plane is not delayed. All right. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.